Hello, it is February 9th and it is 9.45 in the morning and I'm going to do our Ancient India lecture. Now this is only going to be a couple slides long but there's going to be a lot of information to listen to so uh, get ready here and make sure you pay attention. Uh, first of all, geography of India. Uh, a lot of times when you think of India you think of just the country but India is actually a subcontinent. Uh, if you were to look at modern day countries that are part of the Indian subcontinent, you've got India, of course, but you've got Sri Lanka, you've got Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, uh, you've got part of Thailand in there, and you've got Pakistan, a little bit of China, and a little bit of Afghanistan too. Now, the Indian subcontinent, it's highly diverse. It's a lot bigger than you think it is. Uh, for example, you've got mountains at the north. You've got rivers on the east and the west. On the east, you've got the, the Ganges. On the west, you've got the Indus. The Himalaya mountains are at the top. And then you have what's called the Deccan Plain, down in the uh, center of India and the southern part of India, the Deccan Plain, Deccan Plateau. Um, now these mountains are going to provide some protection and some isolation from outside forces. It doesn't stop everybody. There are still passes through the mountain on the east side Here's a big floodplain you can walk through. On the west side, you can get in. And of course, all the coastline. But the Himalayas do provide some protection, some isolation from the outside world. So uh, if you really want to get to India, you can. So some traders get there. There are some religious pilgrims. And of course, invading armies as well. Now the first group of people that we know of, there may have been people there before, but uh, we haven't found any evidence of them. The earliest civilization we know of in the area of India are called the Harappans. We don't know a lot about them because they are fairly recently rediscovered. I'm talking like late 1800s, early 1900s is the first time that we, we uh, learned of them in modern times. And... Archaeologists are still working to uncover their civilization. Now, what we do know is that they're very old. Uh, sometime between 3300 and 1900 is when they existed. Uh, for the most part, we can't read their writing. Uh, some words have been figured out and translated, and work is ongoing on translating the Harappan language. We have found multiple cities, which makes anthropologists and archaeologists think that they are city-based. Uh, two of their big cities are Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa, and Harappa is where they get their name. And their cities are all very similar. They're laid out in similar patterns, and we don't see much change in them over time. The oldest cities we've found look just like the newest cities. The cities all have drainage systems. The cities all have sewer systems. They're laid out in a careful plan. They have city walls. They have granaries to keep and store food. The houses are all small squares without windows. Uh, there are religious buildings, or what, at least what we think are religious buildings, in the center of the town. There's evidence of public bathhouses, you name it. We've also found that uh, the art is pretty consistent. Uh, the money we find, or what we think is money, is pretty consistent. Measurements are all the same. It's it means most likely that they didn't have very many outside influences. Uh, there was no need for them to change. We don't find very many weapons. Uh, we find mostly things that look like they'd be expensive for the day. Beyond this, though, we don't know a whole lot about them. Um, 
we guess they're a theocracy. We think they were probably driven by priests. We think their religion was probably the most important thing. Probably an agricultural economy. We find evidence of wheat growing, barley, peas, cotton, rice, and lentils. We know that they traded. Um, they traded goods such as ivory, gems, and bronze. They traded with China. They traded with Southeast Asia, which would be like modern day Cambodia, modern day Vietnam. And we think their religion was related to Hinduism. We know they had a pantheon of deities. We know that their deities were nature related. There's evidence of a horned god, most likely a fertility god, such as a bull. And we have some evidence that they did meditation and they did exercise, think yoga. Now, nobody knows what happened to these Harappans. This is one of the things that we are still trying to research. Uh, some of the suggestions, deforestation, deforestation could have led to soil erosion or it could have led to desertification, a drying out, if you will. Uh, there could have been a decline in agricultural production uh, or it could have been a natural disaster. We just don't know. But whatever it was, Around 1900 BC, the evidence of the Harappan starts to disappear. And our best guess is by 1500, the Harappans are completely gone. Now, at almost that same time, there's another group who come into the area. And these groups are called the Aryans. Now, just as a side note, you may have heard the word Aryan before, especially when you're discussing... World War II, Adolf Hitler, Nazism, etc., etc. I always try to tell people that they're not related. Aryanism in Nazi Germany was completely made up. These people, the Aryans from ancient India, they were a group of people who moved from the Caspian and Black Sea area down south into modern day India. Now, if you're not very good at geography, and it's okay if you're not, the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea, that's going to be southern Russia. That's going to be like uh, Armenia, Georgia, uh, I think Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, all those types of places. That's near the Caspian and Black Sea. Now, these people are going to move from that area somewhere around 1500 BC. They're going to migrate into India. And they're not actually an ethnic group. They're a cultural group. An ethnic group and a cultural group are similar, but they're not the same. Uh, they're not all the same ethnicity, but they have a similar culture, a similar language, which is why they're a cultural group. Um, it's thought that they moved from Southern Russia to Persia and then some of these people moved into India, others moved into Europe. Now, what does that mean? The language of these Aryans is actually related to the languages we speak today. If you're from a European descent, or if you are a native English speaker, or even a native Spanish speaker too. Now, over the next 500 years, meaning by 1000 BC, the Aryans are going to establish dominance over northern India. And there is some mixing with another culture. Uh, the Aryans are primarily nomadic, and they encounter a group of people called the Dravidians. Think David, but with an R. So it's D-R-A-V-I-D, Dravidians. Uh, it's thought that these Dravidians were possibly the ancestors of the Harappans, but we don't have that connection 100% sure, but that's what our thought is, that these Dravidians were actually the leftover Harappans. And these Aryans, they're going to be able to take over. They 
travel in small bands, they move constantly, um, they're always on the move because they have cattle that are grazing, and they have horses, they have chariots, they have copper weapons, bronze weapons, which were all things the Dravidians didn't have, which is kind of how they're able to take over. Uh, when the Aryans take over, uh, they're going to ban racial mixing. So Aryans and Dravidians cannot mix together. And the Aryans are going to put themselves kind of at the top of the list. We have some evidence of the Aryan religion, and that's in these books called the Vedas. Uh, the Vedas are texts that preserve the culture and the rituals of the Aryans. It tells us about the Aryan belief system and it tells us what the Aryan priests did. And we also have a class-based society. We have Brahmins who are the priests. We have Kshatriyas who are the warriors. Vyasas who are the merchants, sudras, who are the farmers and the laborers. And then at the bottom, we have pariahs, which are known as the untouchables. And this is eventually going to develop into the caste system that you've probably heard about. Uh, each of these castes, they have their own moral code, and their moral code is called a dharma. Uh, so if you're a Brahmin, you're going to have a certain set of rules, a certain set of laws, a certain set of customs you believe. The same thing with Kshatriyas, same thing with Vyasas, Sudras. You live within your caste. You live within your group. Now this Dharma, this moral code, it controls everything. It controls what you can do in life, who you can marry. It even controls what you can eat. There's no class mixing, just like there's no racial or ethnic mis mixing, there's no class mixing either. A Brahmin cannot marry a Sudra, a Sudra cannot marry a Faisa. Uh, it is strict with their, with their uh, castes. Pariahs are completely separate. Another word for pariah is untouchable. They made up somewhere around 7% of the population. Originally, the pariahs were slaves, then they were known as outcasts, and they were seen as the lowest of the low. Whenever they were walking, they had to bang two sticks together so people knew they were coming. They could not eat with other castes at all. They could not be seen with other castes. And they did the dirtiest work. They did undertaking. Uh, they did leather tanning, and they did sewer cleaning. Now you might ask, well, why, why leather tanning? Well, it's because leather comes from cows, and cows were sacred to the Aryans. Now, the top three, Brahmins, Kshatriyas, and Vyasas, that's Aryan only. Uh, Sudras was open to the Dravidian people as well. And pariahs, once again, completely outside of everything else. Now, religion that's going to develop in ancient India, it's a combination of what was left over by the Harappans and what the Aryans brought in. Those Vedas I mentioned, they are not just religion, they're not just history, they're both put together. So the Vedas are holy texts. You have these books that were written around 1400 BC. And one of the Vedas is called the Rig Veda. It has over a thousand hymns, over a thousand songs. And all these hymns, all these songs are to their gods. Now, the longer the hymn is, the more important the deity is. So for example, their primary, like one of their primary gods, Vishnu or Shiva, would have a really, really long hymn where Bob, the god of shoe tying, may have a sentence. There's also a Veda called the Upanishad. 
And the Upanishad is about 200 chapters long, and it contains all of the key beliefs that are going to become known as Hinduism. There's a poem called the Mahabharata. It's over 200,000 lines long. And being that it's an epic poem, that means it was originally memorized. And the most famous portion of the Mahabharata is something you have to read this week called the Bhagavad Gita. And it tells the story of Prince Arjuna who has to choose between right and wrong, has to choose between his moral duty or not. And it's a very tough decision. I don't want to give away too much of it because you have to read it, but it really makes you stop and think, you know, what's, what is my duty and should I complete my destiny, I guess, if you will. Now, something that I find unique about Hinduism is, depending on your point of view, it is both monotheistic and polytheistic. Meaning, some people see it as having one god, some people see it as having multiple gods. And here's how that works. Depending on the point of view, depending on which way you look at it, there is one supreme deity who breaks up into multiple parts, or there are multiple deities that form together to create one supreme being. So... If you are familiar with the Christian point of view, which probably most people in this part of the world are, you have the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. That's all seen as one supreme being that has broken into three different segments. Well, some people in Hinduism believe that uh, Purusha broke into multiple deities and multiple parts. So Hinduism is both monotheistic and polytheistic. Another interesting thing about Hinduism is the idea that time is not linear. It's circular. It goes in cycles. They also believe truth is eternal. Truth will set you free. Every person has a soul, and the soul is known as Atman. And at the end of your life, your soul, your Atman, is judged. Uh, you have your Dharma, which is your moral code. How well did you live up to your moral code? Did you do what was expected of you? Then that's weighed against your karma. Now, a lot of times in our society today, we think of karma as you get what you deserve. But to a Hindu, that's not that way. Uh, karma to a Hindu, it's the balance of actions versus inactions and what the result of that was. It's kind of like cause and effect, if you will. Um, everything you do or don't do can have multiple outcomes. Some of those outcomes are good. Some of those outcomes are bad. So karma is going to be the balance of your actions versus your inactions and the outcome of that. So your dharma, how well did you live up to your moral code, is weighed against your karma, the actions and inactions you took in your life. And all that kind of comes together, cause and effect, and your soul, your atman, is judged depending on that. Now all of this takes place in a cycle of birth, death, and rebirth known as samsara. Uh, we think of that as reincarnation today. Now, this measurement of your karma versus your dharma is the act of samsara. And if your soul needs further purification, you are reborn into another body, if you will. Now, depending on how well you have done, you can move up a caste you can move down a caste, or you can stay the same place you were. Now, the ultimate goal of this cycle of samsara, the ultimate goal of this reincarnation cycle, is to reach moksha. And moksha is the release of your soul from the cycle of samsara. And if you 
reach moksha, then your spirit goes and joins with Brahma, who is seen as the most important of the deities. All right. Now, as I told you, short, to the point, simple. I think that was five slides. Um, one interesting piece of news that we just got last night, actually, is that um, it looks like March 1st will be a return to class. Now, what's interesting for us is March 2nd, which would be our normal class day, we won't have class that day because it is a teacher work day. I have to be in meetings all day. But just keep that in mind if you are taking classes other than mine, that March 1st, as of right now, is going to be your first day back in the classroom. All right, last reminder, make sure you check the syllabus for any work due this week. Make sure you get that work done by Monday night at 11.59 p.m. And as always, if you have any questions, concerns, anything like that, feel free to email me and I will get back to you as quick as I can. We'll see you next week. Bye.